welcome back to another edition of the True Crime Show, featuring the most shocking killers in true crime history and the authors that have written about them. Now on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Kevin M. Sullivan. Now Kevin is a retired minister and the author of over 14 books. He's a former contributing writer for Snitch, which is a weekly newspaper devoted to crime and the law, and he lives in Kentucky, USA. Now he joins me today to discuss his latest book, The Encyclopedia of the Ted Bundy Murders. Kevin M. Sullivan, welcome to the show. Well, I appreciate you having me on, and uh, we should have an interesting time talking about Ted Bundy. I think so. I think so. Now, obviously, you've been asked this question so many times, but um, how did you initially get involved in the Ted Bundy case? And also, probably on top of that, just give us a bit of background on yourself as well. Okay. Well, uh, I spent most of my life in the in the ministry, and I still do things. Uh, I'm still a pastor of a small church, but I've been a, a writer for uh, for really really the last 25 years. And I write mostly true crime, but but uh, I write some history. My first book was a personality uh, study on uh, George Armstrong Custer, who was in the Civil War here in here in the U.S. and uh, died at a place called the Battle of the Little Bighorn in in Montana. That 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 was my first book, but I had a great interest in true crime, and because I started reading true crime when I was just ten years old, and uh, the first book, in fact, that I read uh, the first adult book was a, a, a book by a man named Charles Franklin, a British author. And in 1965, his book was published, The World's Worst Murderers. Well, they had a publication in the U.S. the same year. So this was 1965. I was 10 years old. And my father, who, who was an attorney, he had a fairly large library and he had Franklin's book. And so one day I picked it off the shelf here. I am a 10 year old kid. I picked it off the shelf and I started reading it and I was fascinated by it. And what happened was uh, I finished the book in three weeks. I never really told my parents, you know, what I was reading, but I did go to my mother several times and I said, there were certain words that I didn't know. And I said, mom, could you explain this to me? What, what, what exactly does this word mean? So after three weeks, I, I was finished with the book. And I must say, except for being in school, I never again read a, a kid's book. I was always reading adult books, true crime, things like that. But I went into the ministry for, and, th and that was my vocation for a lot of years. But, but so in, when I was 40, I published my first book. It was that book on Custer. In 2013, I would write a full biography of Custer, but everything else I've ever written is true crime. Now, what's interesting about Ted Bundy and what happened to me uh, concerning him was I never had any intention about, you know, you know, writing about Bundy. He just wasn't on my radar. I was familiar with the case to, to, to some degree, but I had a friend who has passed away now, and his name was James Massey. And uh, Jim was a patient and paroler in Louisville, Kentucky for many, many years, told me, years and years ago that he was friends with a retired homicide detective out of Salt Lake City by the name of Jerry Thompson. And that Jerry Thompson was a lead detective in the Bundy case for that state. Of course, Bundy, when he began his murders, he began in Washington State. He traveled to Utah, he the new killing ground. He wanted to go to a law school down there. And we can get into that later. But so he asked me, he said, you know, uh, we, you know, we had talked about Jerry for uh, a number of years. His name would come up. And then I got a call from Jim one day in uh, uh, March of 2005. And he said, the Thompsons are coming to Louisville. Would you like to have dinner, you know, with us? And I said, that would be great. Because I, I, I thought that would be nice meeting Jerry. And so in May, they showed up here in Louisville. And it was on a Sunday night. I received a call from Jim. He was going to let me know where we were eating dinner. And he said to me over the phone, he said he brought the bag. And I said, what bag? He said the bag that Ted Bundy carried, which was his murder kit. And then I remember that Jim had told me a number of years uh, before then that Ted Bundy, when he was arrested in Utah, uh, he lost his murder kit, which was a like a, a brown gym bag. There was a, 
a pantyhose mask in there, a ski mask. There was uh, an ice pick. Uh, Bundy used to use an electrical cord for choking, and 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 that was in there. And there was some rope for binding hands and feet. Bundy had taken some of the, uh, a white bed sheet, torn it in strips. That was also for binding people up. And so uh, I said, "You got his bag?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, can you meet me a few minutes before?" Um, we go into the restaurant so I could see this stuff. And so that, so he did, and, and I showed up, and, and we looked at all this. And then after dinner, we went back to a place here in Louisville called the Breckenridge Inn, where the Thompsons were staying. We sat around the pool and, and talked, and I interviewed Jerry. And Jerry turned the bag over to Jim for the entire time that he was in Louisville, which was about four days. And so the next night, I called Jim, and I said, hey, would you mind if I bring the murder kit to my house? I'm would like to I would like to photograph it he said no problem so I, I go over to Jim's house I get this bag I put it in the passenger seat of my car it's nighttime I'm driving home with it I call my wife on my cell phone I said honey there's probably nothing on the dining room table but if there is could you please clear it off I'm bringing Ted Bundy's murder kit into the house well she didn't really like that idea but she said okay but she said okay and I remember, and I think I mentioned this in the book, um, that as I drove that night, I would pass under street lamps and there would be this light, it would be dark, and then the, this glow would come in and there would the bag. And I thought, what a surreal situation this is to have Ted Bundy's you know, murder kit. So I, I brought it to, to the house, I photographed it, and uh, uh, a couple of those pictures are on the all over the internet net now, of course. But as the Thompsons were leaving two days later, he gave Jim and he gave me one of the uh, green glad trash bags that Bundy used to carry in his murder kit. And what that was for was he would use these uh, trash bags to put the clothes of his victims in and he would dump the clothes somewhere down the road, far away from, from, the, from you know, the victims. I mean, th this was before DNA, but but Bundy knew that there could be identifying things with the clothes, with hairs and things like that. So the only thing he ever left on a victim would be maybe like a beaded necklace. Everything else, if you found one of his victims, and they did from you know, t you know time to time, they would be nude. And Bundy admitted later to burying some victims. He said those victims were never found. But... But, it, but so he gave me, you know, one of these bags, and he gave Jim one, and so... Uh, I, I, I would I wasn't on staff, but there was a paper here in Louisville called Snitch, and it was a uh, it, it was published in about four or five states. And staff, but I would be a, contrib a contributing writer. And I wrote an off meeting Jerry and being given this bag for for Snitch, and I thought that that would get this out of my system. It didn't, and it just kept building within me to maybe write a book about this guy. And so I decided to do it. I had a number of people say, well, you know, Bundy's been done to death. You probably, probably shouldn't write a book about Bundy. But sometimes, and I've told people this, you have to really go with what you know. And so I decided to do it. And, and what was interesting is that about um, halfway through the book, I was learning new things about the murders at least three or four of the murders that had never come out before, new things about the case in general. And as I approached writing this book, I knew I could write a book that would I, I felt would go well with the previous bio, biographies of Bundy that are out there. What I didn't know is how unique the book would become once I started to find out this new information. And in fact, the way that I wrote it, because many of the previous Bundy books were written uh, where, you know, the girls d disappear and nobody knows what's going on. But in my book, at least they don't know for a while, you kind of follow Bundy all through his life and, and you're, you're kind of right there, except for the first chapter where I keep him kind of in the shadows. <laughs> This book, I sold the book even without the help of an agent after it was finished. It was a, that, that book took me a long time. I interviewed so many people, uh, tens of thousands of pages. I had to get up documents and things like that. And it was a really a marathon thing, two and a half years. I've never written a book like I wrote The Bundy Murders. It was two and a half years of 
uh, seven days a week, night and days, working on the book. I would be out to dinner with my wife. I would get a call from somebody, a detective or a reporter. I'd take the call. You know, my wife would come on. She'd go to the bed. I'd go back to the you know, computer. But it was it, it, it. So I crammed all of this book into two and a half years, and I was lucky to do so. But once the book, you know, was sold, um, you know, nobody knew who I was in the world of true crime. And it, it took a while for people to understand who I was. But then over the years, the books just kept selling and selling. And by 20, you know, sick, well, there were documentary makers that were contacting me from, from the UK early on. But the US doc makers, they, it, it took a while for them for some reason to find out who I was. But in 2017, I started getting calls from uh, all these documentary uh, folks and from either in the UK or in the US. And everyone I talked to had my book, The Bundy Murders, A Comprehensive History. And, you know, I, I never had promoted it to documentary people. They just, it's kind of like through the grapevine over the years, it just kept getting out and and people enjoy the book and it's it's done well. And so that was really the, the, the breakout book that caused me to be known in the world of true crime, especially in the world of Ted Bundy. Now. It was a it was a it was a draining book to write. It was an emotionally draining book. But once I was finished with the book, it was like, oh, this is great because I'm done with it. I can pull back from that dark world. And now, you know, it's not the same doing interviews and things like that. And and I thought this is going to be OK. And, and it's it, it will be fun to promote the book. But I was really glad to be finished with it. And uh, I never expected to write another book about Bundy. And then I think it was 2014 or 2015, I had a fairly well-known writer approach me and ask me if, if, if I would collaborate with him on a book about Bundy, some other uh, murders that he may, may have committed. And I, I, I considered it. I knew I would make some money from it, but I didn't really want to go down that road again. But in 20. 15, um, a couple of my contacts, one had passed away and the other one was having serious medical problems. And uh, I thought, you know, if I'm ever going to do a companion volume, maybe kind of just go back into the case, not have to write, the, you know, the book again. I've, I've done the biography of Bundy and the full treatment of the murders. But interview new people. People have contacted me over the years and I would have to vet them. And whenever they were valid Bundy contacts, I would interview them and I would keep this material. And um, so I thought, you know, maybe I should do a companion volume. And in about 2016, that book became The Trail of Ted Bundy, digging up the untold stories. And like the first book, uh, there were a lot of new information in there and a lot of good interviews from people who, who, who had never come forward. Um, Several people that came forward for, for that book uh, had were Ted Bundy's Mormon friends. And one of them, um, he told me, I don't know why he opened up to me. I, I don't know. He, he just, um, he decided to, I guess, take a chance and open up to me. But he told me, he said, you know, one of the national magazines here in the States um, offered me a, a tremendous amount of money three days after Bundy was put to death to give my story. He said, I didn't want to do it. So he had never talked to really anybody about it. I was the first writer to uh, approach him that he responded to. And so his testimonies in there and a lot of those. So that book was, was a great companion by him. Well, that, that led into the next book, which was the Bundy secrets, which uh, has a lot more interviews and things like that and a republication of the record. And um, with commentary from me, and the last book I was going to do because of some new things that had surfaced was a book called Ted Bundy's Murder Mysteries. And that was really, really supposed to be it. And it turned out to be a great book. But two days after the book was published, this fellow, this, this friend of mine contacts me and he does a lot of research into the American Civil War. And he said to me, uh, he said, have you ever thought about doing an encyclopedia of Ted Bundy. I said, no, I said, I just, my publisher just published Ted Bundy's, you know, Murder Mysteries. And, you know, anytime a book of mine is published, I like to take about a week off, 
just kind of bask in it, just kind of relax. And here this guy's talking to me about another book. So I said, no, I haven't considered it. But I said, you know, I am. I, I don't think I want to do that right now. I said, but it does sound like a good idea. I said, so let's just put it on the shelf for now. He said, okay, that, that, that's good. He said, I would do it myself, but I've got too much work in this other area having to do with the Civil War. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, but it was a great suggestion. Well, several days later, every time I thought about it, I thought, you know what? That might be a good idea, but I think I, I could close this down completely if I contact my publisher. And if they go, oh, we're not that interested, then I can say, oh, well, I'll wait on it. But I let my publisher know about it, and they thought it was a great idea. So that led to the fifth book. And I must say, um, I'm, I'm a little surprised I hadn't thought about it. I'd never thought about doing an encyclopedia of Ted Bundy, but there's nothing out there like that on the market. I mean, there's encyclopedias of serial killers in general. Yeah, but n nothing about exclusively with Ted Bundy. So, yeah, that's that. I thought, well, that was a smart thing to do, and I was very grateful that my friend even suggested it because now it, it, it exists now and that's a good thing. And the detail in the encyclopedia that you go into and, and just remind us again, just how many years that was two years you said to do this particular book, was it or? Oh, now that no, I two and a half years on the Bundy murders, a comprehensive history, but this was about uh, eight or nine months, I think. But I, the, the, yeah, the nice thing about it was and it was kind of fun because I was able to do some research into people that I didn't like catch the first time. For example, a lot of these newspaper writers that covered the story from the Salt, uh, the Salt Lake uh, Tribune to the Seattle Times, things like that. I was able to research their lives and talk to some of these people. And, uh, you know, they went in the book because it was my goal to put everybody that I could possibly put in. I mean, there might be somebody I missed, but you know, there's hundreds of names in there and dozens of locations. And I tried to bring out the more obscure things so that people, and, and there were so many things in there that I didn't know, like these writers for, for these newspapers. I mean, they went on to publish books or the one guy, he, he uh, ended up leaving uh, you know, journalism and then going in and be, became a, an investigator. And his sole goal was to get people who were like on death row or had been uh, wrongly convicted to prove their cases. And he ended up providing a lot of information for people who were wrongly convicted. So, I mean, they, these people led some very interesting lives. But if you look at the Bundy case, you just stand back and look at it. These people are just showing up like just. Uh, names in newspapers and nobody really knows anything about them and of course as the years rolled on with these people a number of them have died and uh so those ones that were that when as this book was going to press uh, and it didn't make it in there but ron holmes who was a criminologist here in louisville who had interviewed bundy um oh, several times and um uh, was th they were close at one point and bob keppel the um, investigator from Washington State, he told me once on the phone, he said, you know, had Holmes not had a falling out with Ted Bundy, uh, he said, I think Holmes was Bundy's golden boy, and he was going to confess all, the, all, all his murders to, but they had a falling out, and he said, so then all those went to me, and then, of course, Bundy confessed to other investigators around, but, 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 um, but Holmes passed away just as the book was going to press, and so you'll find him in my book w without a birth and death date, but he died actually, but uh, you know, just soon as the book was going to press, but you'll find a lot of information, what happened to people. And um, I'm sure that if we ever do a republication of the book, I'll have some more names that maybe I missed that I can add to it. But you know, that, that always happens. I'm, just, I'm, just... I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you will do. And, and just for, for the audience, uh, when was the first murder that we think, uh, well, that was documented, uh, proven that Bundy committed and when was his last murder? Yes. Well, um, Bundy admitted to Bob Keppel that his first murder was in 1973. He said he had picked up a hitchhiker in the Tumwater area of Washington State, that's a little bit south of Seattle, and murdered her. He didn't give a lot of details. Now, one thing about Bundy's confessions to murder um, there were some murders he would talk about. There were some murders he wouldn't talk about. At one point with Keppel, 
Bundy made a mistake and admitted he killed somebody in 72. And when Keppel tried to press him on it, he backed out of that and he wouldn't talk about it. And um, when he was doing his confessions at the end, he said, um, so he said, well, you know, I, I, I killed 11 in Washington state, but he would only give Keppel the names of five in the Utah with the Utah detectives. He admitted that he killed eight in the state, but he would only give the names of five. So there were some things he was wanting to hold on to. From what we know, the Tumwater girl was probably the first in 1973. There could have been a couple of murders in 69. Some girls in New Jersey. Bundy did tell Dr. Art Norman that while he was back east in 1969 to see his family, the cows, and he enrolled at Temple University in Pennsylvania. Uh, he told Norman, he said that, that he did commit two murders while he was back there. So some of this is shrouded in mystery. And there's even the possibility that Bundy uh, killed a little girl named Anne Marie Burr uh, on September 1st of 1961. Uh, she, he was 14 at the time, he lived a couple of miles away. He did have an uncle that lived in the area. Uh, and he, from the circumstances that we know, I would say that Bundy did not do it because there were times when he was asked and he denied it. However, when he was interviewed by Ron Holmes before they had this falling out, B Bundy absolutely linked himself to that murder. And if you're familiar with how Bundy did confessions before the end, uh, he, would, he would talk about these murders in the third person. And Holmes had asked him uh, some as to when this other Anne-Marie Burr was, she, she was eight. And he said this same person uh, could have been involved in murders in the Lake Sammamish area. Well, of course, that is, is Ted Bundy because in, on July 14th of 1974, he abducted two women from Lake Sammamish in Washington State Jane saw it in the morning, kept her at a location in the woods a few miles away, went back to the lake, and uh, at 4.30 p.m., uh, abducted uh, Denise Naslin and took her back there and then assaulted her and then killed one in, in front of the other and then killed the other. Um, that's what he would later tell uh, the FBI agent, William Hagmeyer. But uh, so we're looking at, so what we know for sure is that he killed in 73, but in 1974, there was a change within him that was different. No matter how many he killed before, whether it's just one or three or four, in 1974, he decided that he was going to cross over from this constant fantasy life he had of sex and violence, cross over from just fantasy to murder. And he was going to do it in a way that he was, not, he was never to come back from it. And so I say that his launch in the murder, his launch in the full-time murder, actually began in uh, the, really I call it the dawn of 1974. And uh, he had attacked one woman on January 4th. Karen Sparks thought he killed her. Uh, he uh, uh, used a, a medical device called a speculum and uh, rammed it inside of her and damaged her and beat her severely. And I'm certain that Bundy thought that this woman was going to die. She didn't die, though. And uh, his next victim, instead of assaulting her in the rooming house, was Linda Ann Ely, which happened on uh, uh, the early morning hours of February 1st, 1974. Instead of leaving her, he goes into her uh, rooming house, which was a uh, a house where four or five co-eds lived and she had a basement apartment and another woman, I believe it was Karen Scavine, was right beside her. And the only thing separating the two rooms in the basement was a thin, uh, you know, a wall, like a plywood wall. So you couldn't make a whole lot of noise or one's going to hear the other. And after he choked her uh, into, he woke her up most of by choking her. He didn't use a, uh, a tire iron on her, but he choked her and that created a nosebleed. Well, 
it was, it was really bizarre. I've never heard of, a, of, of an, an abduction like this. But what, what he did was he, he, he choked her into unconsciousness. She had this nosebleed. He takes her nighty off, blood had run on the back of the nighty. He hangs that up in the closet. He takes her off the bed, lays her either on the floor or in a chair. He makes the bed. I, I like to say almost like in a military fashion. Uh, Linda could never make her bed that well. And in fact, she didn't make her bed at all during the week because she had to be at 6.30 in the morning to her ski reporting job before classes like two hours later. So she wouldn't even make the bed. But he did that. He made the bed. Then he carried and he, he, he took a red backpack or book bag or something from her room. M might have taken some clothes, but he carries the woman out. If this is this is in a university district where, you know, young people could be walking around at any hour of the day or night. And he carries her out and um, he either carried he, he walked up the basement steps and he went out the side door. He either went around to the backyard and there was no gate on the fence back there and let her down that way because um, that was an alley back there. It's a little narrow, but there's an alcove where he could have parked his, his, his VW or he took her down the front steps. I, I know I shot a documentary with ABC uh, 2020 and they asked me to explain it uh, both, both ways that, that, that could have happened and I did. And it, it may be that and they played one of them, but it may be that he went down the front step. In any event, it was a very bold abduction. But if you look at what, what he did, uh, having, uh, you know, Karen Sparks not, not die on him, which he wanted her to do, I think he was going to make sure that, that he killed this one, not just assault her there, but assault her and take her out of there to do whatever he was going to do. So we're looking at 1974, and when that happened, Bundy never looked back you know he was still involved and you can look at a progression with Bundy he's still involved in in um, the Republican Party and in Washington State uh, campaign meetings things like that but over the months as the killings went on he started pulling back from all of that so you know and then of course the, the, so his most most of his murders were in the year 1974 but there's still a sense of mystery that surrounds Bundy and his murders. And so when we talk about the previous murders before 74, there can be a number of them there. We just don't know for sure. So 74, you know, was the last murder basically. Well, at, no, he, he actually did all, all of 1974 and then he left. Uh, I'm sorry. 1974 was in, in Washington state. He left and went to Utah in the fall of, 74 and then he killed in utah and, and then uh colorado and uh and then idaho all in the 1975 until his arrest in utah in august of 1975 so that full year the launch in 1974 it was a full year of murder except he ended up leaving washington state in september of that year continued there and then he was able to kill again in 75 until he got back around to August of 75 and he was arrested th at that point. So, and then he would not kill again. He would not kill again until he escaped Colorado later and made his way to Florida. And of course the Kyle Omega murders happened uh, January 15th, 1978. And then uh, uh, <clears throat> on February uh, 9th, um, or I should say um, February, yeah, fe February 9th, he would kill Kim Leach. So, and, and then it, it was, he was kept in Pensacola on the 15th of February of 78. But his main time of murder was 74 and 75. I should say it that way. Okay, so what year was his final murder then? His final murder was the murder of Kim Leach, which was a 12-year-old girl at Lake City in Florida. And it is, uh, you know, when you think about some of these murders, that they happen just by chance. And when I visited the school in Lake City, Kim Leach was 12. She went to Lake City Junior High. Um, there, there is the main school. And then they have what we call portable buildings. And that morning, Kim Leach had left her purse in one of the, I believe it was the portable. 
and her teacher, John Bishop, sent her back to get her purse. And it was while she got in her purse, and I think was on her way back, Bundy had been circling the school and uh, in, a, in a stolen van uh, from uh, Florida State University. And uh, saw her and he was able to grab her. But that, that was his last murder. And uh, again, that was February 9th of 1978. So that so that would be the final murder. Wow. Okay. Okay. So um, now he killed. Um, well, we we you presume he killed upwards upwards to thirty six people. Yes, I think it goes a little higher, but not much. Um, and, and here here's why: Bundy did ne- he never wanted to admit that he enjoyed killing preteen girls sometimes so we, we know he killed leach she was 12 he, in pocatello idaho he killed lynette culver she was 12 uh but bundy admitted in the third person speaking of a murderer that he may have killed up to a half dozen of 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 young girls and so a lot of the detectives believe, and I, 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 I actually fall in line with this as well. I believe that these were some of the murders he did not want to talk about. So the count is right about 36, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if it went to like 42 or 43, okay. something like that. So, so how were the young girls killed? Were they just strangled, were they? or? Well, you know, his M.O. was pretty um, consistent. One of the, Bill Hagmeyer told me, he said that Bundy's favorite MO was when he murdered somebody was to be having uh, sexual intercourse with them from behind while he choked them. Now that could vary some, it could. And uh, it did vary with, with, with uh, a, a couple of girls, the Lynette Culver abduction, which was in Pocatello, Idaho, he admitted to bringing her back to his room at the Holiday Inn. He actually, he actually found her as she was coming out of, of the school and you know, called her over to his VW and she got in his car willingly. They went back to his hotel room. Uh, we don't know whether he assaulted her on the way back, but he did say he had a, a lengthy conversation with her. And, but he got her in the uh, hotel and at some point he drowned her in the bathtub, which was a different MO for him. That's not what he usually did. But then he did admit to w- one of the Idaho investigators, his name was Randy Everett. He, he did admit to uh, having sex with her after she was dead. And that's another thing Bundy didn't like to talk about, but he just came out and said it when he was talking to Everett about this. So so let me get this right. He hated being judged for killing young girls, but he had no problem yes. with killing women. Yes. He didn't seem to be embarrassed at all to finally admit that he killed women. He, There were times when I think he enjoyed talking about it. The things that embarrassed him were things like the necrophilia. He, he never really wanted to talk about the necrophilia, although he would hint at it or in some cases admit to it, but he tried to stay away from it. And he also did not want to talk about the murder of young girls. And when he was, in fact, when he was arrested in Florida, um, the van, uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, stolen Volkswagen that, that he had, had a, uh, like a high school cheerleader magazine in it, okay? so. Yeah, he had a thing also for young girls, but he never wanted to really talk about that. And he mostly killed uh, college-aged females. That was his mainstay for murder. But he would d- delve into those who were 12. I mean, I've got some reports in my case files of you know girls as young as 10 disappearing in an area where he was operating at the time he was operating, but they never found the body, so they don't know the connection. But but I hear that and I go, hmm, it could be Bundy. And so, you know, it, it's possible. Is there any conflict between doing this work that you're doing now and being a ministry before? You know, I mean, this has led you down to sort of look at the nature of evil in a sense as well. Yes. Well, that's a good question. You know, people, my congregation, you know, we joke about this, but 
most people, when they hear that I have been a Christian minister, and in fact, I'm, I'm still ordained and I still perform ministry, uh, <laughs> they, they, they think, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a disconnect. You're doing that, and then you're also delving into these terribly evil people. And it's like a disconnect. But, I, but you know, if you look at, uh, and, and I, I will laugh about that, and then I'll explain myself, but, I, but, but really, if you look at... Um, the, the, the Bible and, and, and the study of humanity, you know, you have violence all over the place. You have a lot of evil. You have a lot, a lot of good. You have good people. You have some very terrible people. I mean, you, you remember the story when Herod, when, when uh, it, it was rumored that the birth of the Messiah, Herod ordered, King Herod ordered the murder of every uh, male two, two years and younger just to make sure that he, that, he, that he got the Messiah, very bloodthirsty individual. So the scripture says there's nothing new under the sun, and that's really true. Uh, you know, 100 years from now, when we're all gone, there will still be people murdering women and doing terrible things. And there will be people also who are doing great things for people. That's just, that's, that's the nature of this life. So it's kind of okay for me. It's, I'm, I like to call myself a man with his feet in both worlds. That's one way of saying it. Where, where do the families fit in to the work that you, you've done? Because obviously there's a lot of surviving family members out there of, of, um, of this uh, yes. serial killer. Yes. You know, I, I, as far as the family members go, um, there would be there was a couple occasions when I was wanting to contact them, but they didn't want to really be a part of it. And most of the time, I do not want to disturb the families. I don't. In fact, I have interviewed friends of the victims, just friends, not even family members. And these people, all these years later, some of these people have a tough time talking about it. And um, most people don't realize the rippling effect that murder has on a family and on friends. Oh, and it goes on for years. I remember once in that snitch I told you about, I published an article about um, a girl uh, in Louisville back in 1973 who was taken from a drive-in uh, ticket office, that which is in front of the drive-in, you know, on a little gravel road, and she's taking, you know, she's selling tickets. And these two guys grabbed her and murdered her. And two weeks later, they came back to the same drive-in and took uh, a man from the ticket booth and murdered him. And so I was writing this story for Snitch and um, they, uh, the family 30 years later contacted the, uh, the uh, senior editor at the uh, newspaper and was giving him a hard time about it. And so he called me and he said, you know, did you get any of this stuff from a private source and shouldn't have published it? I said, no, I said that it all came from the, um, you know, archives of, of the public police records, department. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. public records and we were in our right. But mm -hmm. it bothered me to learn that they learned of it, the family did, and they were very upset by it. So, I mean, I have all respect in the world for these people. And I've had, you know, I remember years ago, I had a woman uh, tell me she was just, she was very upset that I had written about something. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. And I went to say something to her. And she said, don't tell me, don't tell me. And I said, I wasn't going to tell you anything about the murders and come to find out that this woman who and her husband that had lost this beautiful daughter of theirs uh, here in Kentucky, cheerleader, a straight A student to this terrible killer. Um, they they uh, were there for the arraignment of this man and they were there to hear the sentencing but they did not attend the trial. And she thought for a moment, I was about to give her some details of what happened to her daughter, which is something I would not do. But that's how raw these things can be all these years later. And so, yeah, and so I, I, I have to walk really lightly around folks like this. And, and I don't normally bother them. I mean, I have a great rapport with the detectives and in, in the case of Bundy, I've talked to so many of his friends and interviewed them. They were all very nice friends of the victims, people that were almost captured by Bundy or dated Bundy. They're always willing to talk. And so that's who I normally stick with. And so, but yeah, the family members, 
are pretty much off limits because I just kind of think if they've, they've suffered enough and if I'm try to get into their life, it's just going to cause them more pain. So I try to avoid it. Absolutely understand that. I mean, I'm just doing my first murder docuseries right now, and I did contact one of the family members, well, the only surviving family member, and uh, I learned uh -huh. my lesson never to do that again. Um, that they were, it was, yes. as, it was a, as if the murder just took place the same day that I mm -hmm. met them, you know, and, yes. it, and it was 37 years ago. It had not changed for them, and I, I was like, my yes. God, you know, um, if and I try to put myself in their shoes, like you know, could I have forgiven the murderer? Can would I have been able to do that for yes. one of my family members? And I would. I kept saying to myself, yes, yes I would, because I wouldn't want to live with that, that pain yes. all those years. Do you know what I mean? But we're right. all on different sure. paths. All on different paths. Right. Yeah. Right. And you know, I I, I under there's a couple of killers here. Uh, I, I didn't write a book about them, but I, uh, they, they both recently just died. But there was a a, a duo set of killers called. Lawrence Bitteker and then uh, I can't remember the guy's name. His last name was Norris Bitteker and Norris, and they did they did horrendous things. And um, Steve K, who was the uh, assistant attorney, prosecuting attorney with uh, Bugliosi for the Manson trial, uh, K's ran this trial in California himself on the prosecution of, of Bitteker and Norris. And and so I, I was talking to a couple of these detectives. That, that worked that case. And I said, how, how do you, when you know these guys have done these horrible things, when you would come into court, how would you feel? So this detective said, and we both laughed about it. He said, well, you know, I would like to come in there and walk up behind Lawrence Bitteker and pull out my revolver and shoot him in the head, but you can't do that. You can't do that. Or maybe we could take him into a plane out over the Pacific Ocean, go, you know, five, 6,000 feet and drop him out, but you can't do that. But he said, I will tell you this. These killers who murder these people like this, they should just go ahead and murder the family because they murder them emotionally, and these people are never the same. And but these killers, you know, these psychopaths, they have no remorse. They and here's what Bundy said. Bundy said, I don't know why people get so upset with one or two people missing. I mean, they're just people, and there's plenty of people out there. That's how he thought. That's how he thought. And so if you, the ripples that come out when you, when you commit a murder, and much less 36 to 42 or 43, if you can imagine the ripple that goes out in something like that and the hundreds of lives that are affected forever, and you're right, it's a sore spot and it just never changes for no. these folks. And I, and I wonder if uh, Bundy hadn't have been sentenced to death, you know, whether he would have been put to death within prison by the gangs or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Would he have survived? I mean, he, you know. Yeah. That's been... an interesting question. Mm. Uh, I can t I can give you some information that you might not know. He was offered, and it was a sweet deal, but he was offered by the Florida before his two trials, before, before the trial of the two Kai Omega murders and the Kim Leach trial. The prosecution had offered him, they got permission from the families of the two murdered girls of Kai Omega and the family of Kim Leach. And everybody agreed that if Bundy would stand up in open court and admit that he did this will give you life without the possibility of parole. He had a sweet deal. Everybody that Bundy knew from his attorneys to his attorneys in other states said, Ted, you need to take this deal because if you don't take it, you're going to lose these trials and they're going to put you to, to death. And so he signed this order. He said he would do it. But when it, and the prosecution had said, if Bundy's going to take this deal, the only thing we want him to do is stand up in open court and ex and and confess to the murder. If he argues if he gives speech, it's off the table. The deal's off. So Bundy comes in the next day. He immediately fires Mike Minerva and his battery of of attorneys. Starts. Uh, he goes into a little diatribe about some grievances that he had. And then he sits down and he talked to Minerva and he acted like and Minerva said later, he acted like then he wanted to go ahead and confess and make the deal. They looked down at the prosecutor's table and, and they said, no, nope, the deal's off. And that meant the trials were going to go forward. So Bundy could have had his life in prison. And here's what they would have had to have done. If he had taken that deal, I don't think he, he would have survived in the general population. 
I think he would have ultimately been killed and they would have had to have done something for him or he wouldn't have lasted that no, long. No, absolutely no. Even back back in those days, no, no, absolutely. With, with interviewing some people that I've been interviewing recently from prison right now, absolutely not with the gangs and stuff. They would have taken care of that. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, yeah. Um, uh, just a quick question as well. What happened to the bag of Ted Bundy's um, equipment? What, where, where is that bag now? Well, that's interesting. The uh, the bag uh, w- went back with Jerry Thompson at his house in Sandy, Utah. And Jerry passed away, oh, I guess about close to a year ago, maybe nine months ago. And um, I talked to his wife and I said, you know, and I had suggested this to Jerry Thompson back when I interviewed him. I said, Jerry, what what, what do you plan on doing with that bag? And he said, oh, I don't know, probably give it to my son. I said, well, you know what? I think stuff like that should be preserved. I said, you might want to think about giving it to like the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., or maybe a police museum. And uh, so when Jerry died, I was talking to his wife, Jean. We were messaging each other on Facebook. I said, I I reminded Jean of that. I said, Jean, do you know what you're going to do with that? And she said, well, you know, we've got some ideas. And I said, well, have you ever thought about maybe donating it to the Smithsonian? And I said, if they didn't want it, I could contact some people that I know in the FBI and they have like a museum. They might want it. I mean, it would be perfect, you know? And, she, and so she said that she, she thinks she was going to look that out with the Smithsonian. Well, the next thing I hear is that the bag was sold to a guy named Zach Baggins in the United States. And he bought it for like uh, $150,000 and, Jerry's case files, everything. And this guy is, uh, he had paid $50,000, I hear, uh, for the sunglasses that Bundy used that were found in the stolen, the orange VW in Florida that Bundy had, had, had stolen and used. And um, this guy is on uh, an American TV program. I don't know if you all have it in the UK, but it's called Ghost Hunters. And nowadays, these programs go all over the world, so you all may have it. But his name is Zach Bagg, and so he apparently bought it. And uh, so he has it now. So he's got a crime museum in Las Vegas and he's apparently it's going to go on display there. So at least people will be able to see it. And of course, Bundy's Volkswagen is on display in Pigeon Forge, uh, Tennessee. It was in the crime museum in Washington, D.C., but that closed down. So it's on display. I haven't seen it yet. myself, But it's it's down there, and if I ever make a trip, I'll I'll look at. It. I've seen plenty of pictures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Absolutely, no. It's, it's fascinating. And um, do you think there's any remaining tapes out there of Bundy that haven't been released yet? That's a good question. Um, a friend of mine uh, who um, came to me years ago, who had a great interest in the case. He lived out in Tacoma, and. Um, he was wanting to do some research into this. And I said, have you met Bob Keppel yet? He said, no. I said, well, he's, he's right in your area. He's 30 minutes away in Seattle. And I said, get to know him. You can become friends with him. And they did. And uh, Keppel, he, he let Keppel, Keppel gave him all the tapes and he, he cleaned them and he put them in uh, these different categories. And those tapes showed up later on some of these programs, Netflix and then 2012, the documentary that came out, Ted Bundy, the death row tape. Some of those had already been heard, but they were cleaned up and the quality was so much better. So there probably are some tapes. And in fact, I can't go into it now, but somebody is that worked the case is supposed to give me a bunch of tapes of Bundy that um, that uh, probably uh, for the most part have been heard. But I have to make a trip somewhere, and with this COVID thing going on now, I can't do it. Well, but, that that will but, be interesting and, when you but do. But later, yes, I, yes, and so I, I yes, and even though it it won't be available to me for um for this book, this last book that, that I'm doing, which has to do with a lot of questions and controversies, and there will be some new testimonies in there. Still, though, anything that is um, really of an important nature i'll find a way to release it and uh, because i think pe- people need to hear this yeah oh absolutely absolutely uh thank you for sharing that and um 
Yeah, I mean, there's so much uh, we haven't. I mean, look, look, this is days and days of interviews with you, really, to get into the Ted Bundy case. There's so much to this, right? There really so, is. It's a lot. It's there's a lot. I mean, what was obviously? Would you say that Ted Bundy w uh, had mental health issues? Well, yeah, sure. Now he was legally sane. He knew what he was doing. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little different too. I believe in the concept of evil. I think some people can just kind of turn them over to things. But Bundy was, it, it, I mean, if you're going to murder a woman and cut off her head and do the things that he did, you and I would look at somebody like that and we'd go, that person is crazy. And in the sense that we mean it, it's true. Who, no, normal people don't do that. But he's not legally insane. I wrote about, about a guy in, in uh, Sacramento years ago. The name is is Richard Chase, and Richard Chase was deeply mentally ill. He really was. He thought his blood was turning to powder. He had problems that Ted Bundy never had. Bundy knew who he was. He just did these things. He was a bad man. But Chase was, he really felt like all these weird things were happening. He'd been diagnosed as schizophrenic. He was deeply mentally ill. The prosecution even admitted he's deeply mentally ill. But he wasn't legally insane because he tried to hide his murders he knew what he was doing was wrong so you yes i look at bundy and i go well from me to you and for the rest of the normal people out here we're going to look at ted and call him crazy but in the deeper sense he really wasn't i think more than that he was just evil well when he was doing these murders um and i think there was one i can't remember the particulars of the book right now you'd have to help us out with this but there was one uh, witness uh -huh. that got to see ted almost you know uh taking you know well the murder was taking place should we say or the restraint was taking place and she almost saw she looked at ted she saw ted bundy's face in through the car and uh, he was like his jaw was dropped it was like he was channeling some evil part of himself do you know what i mean oh absolutely absolutely now People do have a tendency to go into these altered states. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, an altered state, um, some of these killers, now they, not just Bundy, but a lot of killers have reported that when they were committing murders, a number of, of them have made statements like this. I felt like I was kind of retracting and going back into myself. And I had this weird sense that somebody else was committing the murder. And I know exactly what you mean about Bundy. There, there was a woman named Jack, uh, her name was Jacqueline Moore, and he had just kidnapped Kim Leach and he was driving that white S, uh, FSU van. And she ne he nearly sideswiped Moore. She had to get out of the way. But she said as she passed him, his, he was doing something with something on the floor in the passenger uh, like floor, in front of the passenger seat and she said his jaw was slack and you know he had this odd look and i can tell you what that is he's gone into an altered state this is not uh, yeah altered state this is not very different than what happened to uh him when he was uh rafting down the yakima with his girlfriend liz she said that when they you know left that morning uh he was fine but you know, he he became more quiet as they as they journeyed on down down the Yakima. Then they stopped and they had lunch together. And then they got back in the raft and started heading down. And he was more withdrawn. Well, I think he was communing with some of the things that he had done, and he was very close geographically to the area where he had murdered Susan Rancourt. And so I think that may have played a part. But Liz said that at one point they're going down in the raft and he pushes her out of the raft and she goes into the cold water of the Yakima. She said when she came out of the water, his face was totally blank. It's like, she said, it was like he wasn't seeing me. And, and that's that what, that's what that altered state. And I say in the book, the Bundy murders uh, that the killer was now with her. He went into one of those altered states, and it's what happened when Jacqueline Moore saw him. Liz also had reported that once when she was having sex with Bundy, excuse me, she was having sex with him, and he was wanting to, like, choke her. And she said at one point when he was doing that, he, 
he was hurting her and she tried to get him to stop and he he wouldn't come to. It took him a second to come back to himself to where he would stop doing what he was doing. Again, that's an altered state of murder. And that's what happens to, to a lot of these people. Now, uh, Dr. Al Carlisle, who was a friend of mine, he's, he's passed on now too, I asked him about that. And I asked him about how the eyes of some of these killers change. He said, we know that sometimes right before they launch an attack, that their eyes will change. He said, I think it's a neurotransmitter thing. And so I have talked about, and this is really, a, it, from an academic sense, this is really interesting to look at this and just kind of break it down. There was a woman that he was, when he was at Central Washington State College, and he was uh, dropping books, he was feigning an injury, he needed help to go to his car. When she talked to him and he said, she, he, she said, you know, I'd like to help you or something like that. May I help you? And he said, yeah, thank you very much. His eyes were fine. But as they walked towards the car, and it was a little bit of a walk, she happened to turn and look at him and his eyes had turned weird. And when you read that, and then you hear what somebody like Dr. Carlisle says, here the eyes seem to be fine. And then they all, then something starts to happen. They start going into that altered state. And then that neurotransmitter thing happens and the eyes do whatever they're doing that makes people think, oh man, that's weird. That's something that's not normal. But it's a very, very interesting thing. And so people would see this. And I, you know, the thing about Bundy, the only people that ever really saw that diabolical aspect of him were those he murdered. And um, the only person that, it, there's a lot of people that have come forward now and they said, well, you know, I was kidnapped by Ted Bundy or this, or he tried to do it. I don't put a lot of stock in any of those because they didn't come forward 40 years ago when these things were going on. They may be, they may not be, but I don't have to be concerned with them because they're really not a part of the story. The only person that we know for a fact that ever got away from, from Ted Bundy was Carol DeRanche and, and, and that, hap that happened in Utah. So, but in any event, um, had he been able to capture Carol, he was in the midst of this fight. Uh, and if he'd have been able to abduct her and take her somewhere, she too would have seen this altered state of murder come out. And, and, and then she wouldn't have you know, survived it. Absolutely. And um, what was his signature? What was a signature of Ted Bundy that you knew that that man had done that murder? Oh, well, you know, he was really smart not to leave anything behind. Now, we, Bundy said um, that those that I buried were never found and that those that were found were those that are left on top or sometimes when he would cut off heads and he would take them like a Taylor Mountain, they, they only found the heads. Uh, but he dumped these heads um, just about a thousand feet from a trail where they could very well be found and they were. Some people think that when he would do things like that, that was kind of like a boast. He was almost like wanting these things to be found. Sometimes when the bodies were left naked and like uh, Laura Ann Amy and Melissa Smith, he deposited them in areas very close, very within feet of roads or a trail. That was how he was wanting to, you could call that like a signature if you want of how he did, but then he would, he would want nobody found. And when he didn't want any bodies found, he would bury them. And in fact, the heads that were found on Taylor Mountain, the bodies are somewhere else. I mean, the bones of those are somewhere else, could be on, on a nearby mountain. But but again, if you get back into his, his MO, uh, is that it would be, you know, it would be strangulation. I mean, I've heard of other murders that may have some elements like Bundy, but pretty much it would be strangulation with normally the bashing in of the skulls. Many of the skulls would have um, would have cranial damage in the rear or rear right portion of the head. In fact, this is interesting. Uh, Bundy carried a Sears model 6577 crowbar. And I, I have one. Uh, uh, it's only 18 inches long. It's not the usual longer crowbar. The reason why he wanted to have a short crowbar is because it would give him room to wield that crowbar 
in the cramped confines of a VW Beetle. And uh, so they would find cranial damage. That would be a one sign. They would find strangulation. So basically his MO. Interestingly enough, they are convinced that Kim Leach, though, was not bashed in the head and was not um, uh, strangled, but rather Bundy used a honey knife to cut her throat, which was a very different MO for him. So the MO could vary, the signature could vary, uh, but most of the time it was pretty standard. So, you know, I mean, if you, if you look at the murders in Chi Omega, I should say this too, they're nothing like how he murdered before. That was more like a frenzy when all before they were kind of planned and he was an opportunistic killer, but he also was a will planner of murder back in Washington state and, and Utah, but they were so different in Florida. So, you know, at the, again, he was going downhill. Absolutely. He was absolutely. I mean, would you, I mean, he would be classed, wouldn't he, as one of the U S uh, worst serial killers or at the top. Yeah. There are some people that have killed more, but, most people, and I, I say this, and in fact, my publisher McFarland just did uh, a second edition of the Bundy murders, and they asked me to write a new preface, and a, a new inter introduction, and a new afterward. And I say in the afterward that it's real funny because you know the UK has had Jack the Ripper. Even though you don't know who he was, uh, he's not going away. Those murders have stayed right there in the forefront of, of, of people in, in the UK. I think Bundy has become like a similar Jack the Ripper. And Bundy is right there at the top. And part of that has to do with it's very hard for people to understand. A lot of killers, they get a lot of tattoos. I mean, this is years ago. When, the, when tattoos weren't popul popular, you'd see certain people coming down the street across to the... But he had none of that. He was articulate. He was educated. He was, he was handsome. And when people study the life of Ted Bundy and they see how the outward Bundy was so appealing, and yet you know what he did, the inward Bundy was so incredibly diabolical. It almost like short circuits them. And, and, and then when you add on top of that, that even though there's a tremendous amount we know about him, there are still aspects of mystery surrounding this case and other murders, for, for example. And so, yes, you know, you have that. And it's just uh, so I think, yes, I think he's considered the premier you know, serial killer of the United States. And like Jack the Ripper, I, I don't expect Bundy to be going anywhere anytime soon. I think they'll be studying about this man 100 years from now. What would you say then, Kevin, is the sort of most important message of, of the overall Bundy material that you've put together so far in the many books that you've done? Well, yeah, that's a good way of, of, of putting it. Um, in in my heart, I am a historian, and I like core things. And it really pleases me whenever I can gather information together and bring it to the printed page so it will be available to researchers and other people years and years from now. And the material on Bundy, after I finish this sixth book, I'll, I'll have written around 1,300 pages on this man, and that, that's a lot of material. And it's been a long journey, but... I know that I have contributed a lot of new knowledge to the case. I know that before people, before they started using my book, The Bundy Murders, uh, it's like one t uh, TV reporter told me, he said, you know, your books have shaped what the Bundy story is now, especially your book, The Bundy Murders. I said, it's true. It's a, I said, there's a lot of people using it. But before my book came out, uh, you just didn't, the documentary makers weren't really giving enough credit to Utah and the Utah detectives and the Colorado detectives. So it really makes me feel good that I did a good job with it. And I was able to pre present the story in a new way where people took notice. And now everybody wants to base a lot of what they're doing about Bundy on these books. And uh, so, I mean, it, 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 I can look back and I go, you know what? I did my job. Because every time I write a book, I'm thinking to myself, I know how much I've loved books all my life. I've been a reader all my life. Each book contains a world of its own. 
And I said, I've always wanted to write what that was, was incredibly interesting and informative. And I'd like to get everything on the printed page I possibly can to make that book enjoyable or interesting or something that they just can't put down. And so when I'm able to do that, that's a lot of, it gives me a lot of pleasure because it, it makes me feel like I've, I've done my job. And Absolutely. so I like that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No. Um, and your website, Kevin, is? Well, actually, if people want to uh, contact me, I've got a number of publishers, but I write primarily now for Wild Blue Press. So if you go to wildbluepress.com uh, and you look for my name, Kevin Sullivan, uh, they have a lot of articles that I've written that are archived, these crime blogs that I've written, and they're all there. You can see what books I have. And also I uh, ask people, because even though Wild Blue Press has a number of my books, there's a, there, I have still other books that they don't even have that are on Amazon. So if anybody wants to go to Amazon, either in the UK, the United States, wherever, uh, you can bring up my author page. It shows you not just all the books I've written, but there will be links to Wild Blue Press where these other blogs are you know noted so so that's that that's that's the that's the best way to do it excellent okay well listen kevin i know we've barely kind of scratched the surface of the bundy case and i i know we will do in the future and I, I, i'm sure you know um we'll cross paths again I, well i've got that feeling we will so i just want to thank you oh, for the work that you're great. doing and i've really thank enjoyed you, having you on really enjoyed so thank you well, thank you for having me on, you know, Kevin, and, and I look forward to doing it again sometime, maybe on, on another subject in, in the future.